Acts chapter 12, and we're going to be continuing on with going through the only historical letter that we have in the New Testament. And so as we're going on, uh, what are some things that we've just finished up last week in Acts chapter 11? In the first half of the chapter, we talked about what? In verses 1 through 19 of Acts chapter 11. About to remember? It was actually two weeks ago because we had to take two weeks. That's right. That's right. We've been leading up to this ex ex expansion of the Gentiles. And so in Acts chapter 8, we have uh, Philip going to Samaria. We have in Acts chapter 9, the conversion of Paul, who's going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Then we have Peter going outside of Jerusalem, further away, going closer to Gentile territory, if you will. Acts chapter 10, we have the conversion of Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. And then in the very first half of Acts chapter 11, the news gets to Jerusalem, even even before Peter does, that now Gentiles have been baptized and are Christians now. And so there's a big discussion over the first half of Acts chapter 11 over whether or not these Gentiles can be Christians, why, why Peter went ahead and did this. And of course we know from our studies that it was God intervening and God was the one that wanted the, the Gentiles to be engrafted in. Paul talks about that in the epistle to the Romans. And then we see in the second half of Acts chapter 11 what takes place in verses 20 through the rest of the chapter of Acts chapter 11. All right, that's right. We have the church in Antioch, right? And so we have the first Gentile congregation at Antioch. And so the apostles send Barnabas to go there. Barnabas helps work there. Many people are being converted. It's the first Gentile congregation. Now we have the first the first congregation where there is more than just Jews. And so they don't refer to themselves as Jews anymore. They're Jews and Gentiles. So they need a new name. And what's the name that they wear? Christians, that's right. The same man that we were today. And then we are told at the end of Acts chapter 11 that there's a famine in Jerusalem. And so they send Saul and Barnabas to Jerusalem with money to help the Christians who are there in Jerusalem struggling with the famine. And so today we're going to look at Acts chapter 12. And that is going to be what takes place when Saul and Barnabas get to Jerusalem. Because it's a pretty jam-packed event. We're going to be seeing death. We're going to be seeing imprisonment. And this is a very scary time in the early church. And so let's go ahead and let's look at Acts chapter 12. All right. And so Acts chapter 12. Oh, and we look at Acts chapter 12, there's going to be a major figure that we're going to talk about, and that's going to be Herod. Now, there are at least four Herods that rule um, Palestine in the first part of the first century. Really, five, I guess you would say. No, no, you have five. And so you have Herod the Great. Herod dies. His territory is broken up between his three sons. And then he has a grandson named Herod Agrippa. And this is the Herod that we're going to be talking about here in Acts chapter 12. And this is a bust of Agrippa dating all the way back to the first century. And so this may have been what he looked like. And so um, this is going to be his territory. If you will look, Herod Agrippa ruled over quite a large swath of land. And so this is most of the biblical area known as Palestine. This is where Herod ruled from A.D. 37 to A.D. 44. He was appointed by Claudius in A.D. 41. He ruled from 41 to 44. And uh, the, the, the amount of land, this was the last time that Israel was kind of a client kingdom of Rome. And so as soon as Herod Agrippa dies in 44, they kind of get demoted. And so there were different levels of status that you could have as a territory in the ancient Roman world. And it was important because it came with tax prestige and all also uh, the money that you got from the government. Well, after Herod Agrippa dies in 44, you're going to see that, that this is going to be um, it's going to be demoted, if you will, from being a, a client kingdom to just being a province of the Roman Empire. And so let's go ahead and let's read verses 1 through 5 of Acts chapter 12. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And this was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made by God. Uh, to God by the church. And so here we have, at the very onset, we have Herod Agrippa kills 
James, brother of John, the first apostolic murder takes place. And so he was the grandson of Herod the Great who killed, Jesus, who killed the babies in Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. Uh, his uncle was uh, Herod Antipas who had John the baptizer beheaded. And so Herod Agrippa came from a long line of very violent men who ruled in this area. So this was kind of par for the course. Josephus tells us that he was a ruler that was very beloved by the Jews. But he was also a ruler that really sought to win popularity contests with the people. So he was very, he was very focused on keeping the peace but also being a very popular ruler. He arrests James. And he sees that the Jews like it because, as we've mentioned before, the church has been growing for about 15 years. James is one of the apostles, and he beheads James. And the Jewish people there in Palestine, they love it. And so if they like it this much, I'm going to arrest Peter. And so he arrests Peter. He brings him in chains. He gives them to four squads of four soldiers. So there are 16 soldiers who were given the authority, I guess, if you will, given the charge of keeping Peter in prison until the days after unleavened bread. Now this takes place around what Jewish holiday? It mentions it in our text. What's that? It's the unleavened bread, but the unleavened bread is attached to the actual, um, it's, it's another holiday. The Passover, right? Now when was Jesus killed? Right? He was killed at the Passover. Right? Pentecost is when the church is established in Acts 2. I, I, I get what you're thinking. Uh, but he's killed at Passover, right? And so here you have the same time that Jesus is killed. Fast forward about 10 to 15 years. And now James is killed and they arrest Peter. But now instead of killing Peter during the Passover like they did Jesus, he's going to wait till after the days of unleavened bread. You see, after the Passover, and they ate the Passover meal with the lamb and the bitter herbs, they would only eat unleavened bread, which we take for the Lord's Supper, so what you had this morning. They only eat that for seven days. Right? And so, not a very appetizing diet, but that's what they did. And so he's got Peter in chains, and he's going to wait till after the days of unleavened bread before he brings Peter out to have him killed before the people. And so we do know that he ruled in the time of Claudius between 41 and 44. So we can kind of pin down the date of when this took place. And so uh, Peter's arrested. And uh, then there's prayers by the church, right? Um, it's important to remember in hard times that God is really the one in control. Herod thinks that he's the one who's calling the shots, but really it's God who is in control. If God did not want James to be killed at that time, then James wouldn't have been killed. Uh, but James was martyred. But uh, was James replaced by an apostle? He wasn't. Now, why is this important? Well, Paul's already become an apostle already. But who's the only other apostle to die, or disciple, if you will, the twelve? Judas. Judas. Now, why was Judas replaced and James wasn't? That's right. Judas betrayed his office as a disciple slash apostle. James didn't. And so James is still even bearing witness to the resurrection of Christ today, even though he's been dead for a thousand years, because James saw the resurrected Lord, believed that to his death, and was willing to die for that. So even though he died as an apostle, his death is still fulfilling the role of an apostle, which was to be a witness to the resurrection of Jesus, right? And so just like the rest of the apostles that would eventually die, according to church history, all 11 apostles die except for John. Uh, all 13, if you want to include Paul in that number, except for John. Um, and these men were willing to die for what they believed. And so they still bear witness. They don't need to be replaced. And so the idea of there being apostles even today, um, whether it's the Mormon church who believe there has to be 12 living apostles or apostolic churches that like to call themselves apostles, um, here James dies. There is no apostle that is elected to replace him. And so there was no need. And, Yeah. 
Yes. During the early, during the first century, the vast majority of persecution the Christians faced were at the hands of the Jews and not actually the Romans. And so during this time, the church has been around for about 10 to 15 years. The church has grown exponentially in, um, during that time frame, the book of Acts tells us. And the Jewish people were already fragmented. We talked about that this morning with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Herodians. So it was a very factious uh, violent time in Jewish history. In fact, 15 years later, after this takes place, really I guess we should say 25 years later, the Jews are going to have the great Jewish revolt. And the Romans are going to come in and destroy Jerusalem and the temple. But it's a very, it's a very violent time. People are really on edge. Um, and so you have this new group that says, you know what, we're not following the laws of Moses anymore. And in fact, Jesus was the Messiah that came. And He doesn't care about the Romans. He didn't come to free you from the shackles of Rome. He came to free you from sin. And there's, the Jews didn't like that because so many of the Jewish people were being converted uh, by the Christians that um, they didn't like them very much. Um, you know, I, you know, whether this is going to be a popular statement or not, the Church of Christ jokes got a lot more popular in the 1960s and 70s after we were the fastest growing religious movement in the 1950s. I don't think there was a coincidence with that. A lot of people being converted, so, you know, let's start cracking jokes and making fun of the members of the church over there. You know, there's, when, when people start taking your membership, they get upset, right? And we're going to see this later in the book of Acts when Paul goes to uh, places in, um, in Asia where he goes and preaches the gospel and he converts half the synagogue. Well, if you're a Jew who goes to that synagogue and half your congregation just got converted, you're going to get mad, right? And you're going to be mad at Paul. And so they take Paul, they try to stone him. Uh, they coerce the Romans, throw him in prison more than once. And so you see this, this, violent, this violence between the Jews and the Christians throughout the book of Acts. And so, good question. Good question. Yes, with Charles. What, what, do you, what did you say all the letters that Paul were killed? Yeah, like when? Well, they weren't all killed at the same time, and so they were killed at different stages. Um, John is believed to be the last apostle who dies somewhere around maybe AD 90, give or take, depending on where you date the book of Revelation. And so the rest of them die. Pretty much you've got James who dies first in probably about 43, 44. And the last one you have, I mean, it's all conjecture, but by the time you get to AD 75, it's believed that most of the apostles are already dead. Of course, we know Peter and Paul die in the mid-60s, sometime between 63 and 68, depending on how you date certain events. And so even in the mid-60s, only 20 years away from this, you'll have the two big apostles, if you will, uh, who are going to die. But according to church tradition, most of the apostles are dead before AD 70. And so... You know, God told uh, Paul that uh, I want to show you what you will suffer for my sake. So... It was predicted that they would suffer. Oh, absolutely. Jesus told the disciples multiple times. In fact, um, earlier in the Gospels, you know, James and John, the mother comes and says, you know, when you come into your kingdom, I want my sons to be on your right and your left. And Jesus turns to James and John and says, can you drink from the cup that I'm about to drink from? And they say, yes. And he said, you will drink from the cup that I'm about to drink from. And this is what he's talking about. Jesus had to die and James dies also here. And so here we see James drinking from that cup that they arrogantly, unknowingly said they could drink from uh, all those years earlier. So. Well, um, Jesus' earthly ministry is about A.D. 26. It is believed that, most, that Jesus was 30 years old and that most of the disciples would have been somewhere between probably 15 and 25. And so if you're looking at them being about that age frame, if most of them die, you know, if that's the case, then James dies here. James is probably in his early 30s. Uh, he's probably in his early to mid 30s. By the time that Peter dies, you know, Peter is probably 50, 55. And so most of them died young, comparative to what our age. Now, the average lifespan of the ancient world was about 55 to 60 years old. And so... Um, 55 death to us is, is young. Uh, in the ancient world, it wouldn't have been that young for them. Um, and when John lives to be in his 90s, dude's older than dirt, right? I mean, he's just, you know, in the ancient world. Not today, the ancient world. Okay, okay. Yes. I wonder, too, in this chapter, we see that 
Peter's rescue. Yeah. But so when do we pick and choose? You know, God has that plan. Yeah. Uh, then he can rescue him when he was going to be killed. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like you were saying. It's amazing to think about. You know, some people would say, well, it's unfair, right? You know, he, he rescued James. I mean, I'm sorry, he rescued Peter, but didn't rescue James, you know. And um, it, it seems like God's plan for James was done. And so we can look at this and say that, you know, James got the short end of the stick, being the first apostolic death. But they all died, and they all died pretty gruesome, painful ways. And so really, was it James who got the short end of the stick, or James who got the better deal? You know, he got to suffer less, and he got to go on to his reward. You know, and so oftentimes on this side we would say, you know, you know, James could be upset right now, but at the same time it's kind of like James may be like, I got there first. <laughs> you know, so it's hard. It's hard. I think sometimes we face that too because oftentimes I don't think God loved Peter any more than he loved James, or if he loved James any less. But oftentimes, like you're saying, even now in our life. We see ourselves, maybe we're suffering from some sort of disease, some type of affliction. Maybe we're going through some type of pain. And we look at somebody else in the church and say, well, they're not dealing with that. Why does God love them more than He loves me? Or why, do he, why does He love me less? And like you're saying, I don't think that that's the case at all. I think we just have different, different paths and different plans. And we all have to bear our struggles. And our struggles will come in different days, different times, different ways. And so... Uh, but it is interesting to think about those things when you look at James and Peter here. I heard God talk to the death of He said, your days are numbered. From birth, you've got a certain day you're going to die. And he based that on God knows the hair of your head, knows how many hairs in your head. Yeah. You've got, you got a certain number, then yeah. you Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's interesting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that for my own personal belief, um, um, but it is interesting. Uh, it's, they get that sometimes from Hebrews. It's pouring into man, want, every man to, to, to die, you know, in the face of judgment sometimes. Steve? Well, kind of what you're talking about this now, too. I always thought it was kind of odd about the raising people from the dead thing, whether it's Peter rising, Tabitha, or, you know, Jesus raising from the dead, uh, Lazarus, that, you know, here's a person who's. I guess live faithfully and now they've gone to the reward and to benefit the people still living rather than them, you bring them back and expose them to the risk that they not in the remaining time they live, they not mess up and lose that reward, you know? Yeah. It's uh it is interesting to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. It is it is interesting. Um, I heard someone in a, in a funeral say something similar to that. You know, if, if, if we could bring them back, we wouldn't because we know where they're at. And, but it is interesting to think about, like you were saying, um, those individuals who were brought back to life and, you know, their perspective or, or, or what. I, it's, we can speculate all day long. We just, we just don't know. But it is an interesting thing to think about uh, in their, their resurrection, their experience, I guess you would say. I don't know. And if you've been there, maybe you're more, you know, maybe you won't be unfaithful because you're going to strive to get back. I mean, I don't, it's a good question. I don't, don't have an answer, but it's a good question. Anyone else? Can you um, talk about a little bit about why they would choose um, to behead somebody? Yes. I mean, we, we see that, you know, several times in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if there any significance to that? Was that like a shameful death or... Yes. Um, normally the only people who crucified at this time were the Romans. And so whenever the Jews killed somebody, there were mainly two ways they would kill, by stoning or by beheading. Now the two ways that, according to the Jewish law at the time, there were two reasons as to why you could commit capital punishment. And one of those was uh, blasphemy, and the other was, um, I forget what the other one was, but... Um, what they would do is they would take the person and they would they would uh, tie them up, basically. They would be standing up and they would take a, a sword and axe and, and chop their head off and it would pretty much fall on the ground. And it was used to be a deterrent. Uh, you know, watch what's going to happen to this guy. Be sure you don't do the same thing. And so it was seen as a as a violent death, but also kind of a showy death. Uh, 
to deter people from making the same mistake, if you will. And um, why they would choose to, to behead someone, somebody, uh, it's just in the ancient world, it just seems to be one of the common types of, of killings, I guess you would say. And so um, I think the reason why that he chose to have James beheaded instead of stoned, oftentimes when somebody's stoned, it's more of an emotional thing, like it's kind of spur of the moment. Uh, whereas a beheading, you know, it's done by a king, so it's, it's a spectacle. You know, it's, it's, it's done in the town square for people to come and watch, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's swift, you know. And if you're, if you're trying to make a statement and you're trying to, you know, call people to come and watch, you know, the hand of the king, you know, you don't want to draw it out. You just want to say, you know, you don't walk the line, this is what happens. And so I think it's more for show. And also the, the imagery of somebody's head being chopped off in front of you, you know, that's a pretty powerful image uh, to show somebody. I think that's why. Other countries these days, that's why they did it. It's, it's, a, it's a display, if you will. It's a, it's, a, it's a show. Yeah. Yeah. Like in the Old Testament, whenever they would chop off the head, you know, they'd all stick. Yeah. How many people have deer heads on their walls? Like a trophy. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes in days gone by, you would have, like you said, uh, official places in town where hanging took place back when they would, you know, the judge was the judge, jury, and executioner, you know, and stuff like that. And so, good comments. Uh, before we run out of time, um, we see here the church gathers together for prayer. And so it's important to remember the power of prayer. Now, Luke writes more about prayer than any other gospel writer. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Luke writes more about Jesus' prayer life than anybody else. Then in the book of Acts, also written by Luke, he talks more about prayer than any other New Testament book. And so if you notice, prayer is always a key focus throughout the book of Acts. And here we see the church gathers together for prayer. Now this is not during a worship service, but they believe in the power of communal prayer. Now these individuals could have stayed at home and they could have all prayed for Peter individually. But they saw the importance of God's people coming together and having communal prayer and praying on behalf of something or someone. And I'm afraid that we have forgotten or underestimate the power of communal prayer even today. And so there's something special when the people of God come together in like mind, like faith together and pray in unison. And so when we have public prayer, there's somebody who is praying but that doesn't mean the rest of us are just bowing our heads and just kind of listening to prayer. No, we're all praying and channeling our thoughts and our prayers on the same person. So we don't have one guy praying for Brother Smith. We have 286 people praying for Brother Smith. And so the church believed in the power of communal prayer, and I'm afraid sometimes we sell it a little bit short. Uh, how, how much more often will we ask for the church to pray for us if we really believed in the heightened power in communal prayer and the church praying for us as a body. Uh, how, much, how much more would we be willing to ask people to pray for us, whether we're going through a spiritual struggle, or maybe we just got something general that's not really spiritual in nature, but maybe we're worried about a test, maybe we're worried about the disease or, that we have, or something like that. How much more apt, you know, sometimes you have individuals that will have a procedure done, they don't want anybody to know. You know, tell the church, let's pray for you. you know, there's power in prayer when they do that. And so, moving on to verses 6 to 11, let's go ahead and read that together. Verses 6 to 11. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door was guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and he followed him, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed through the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city, and it opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went along on the street, and immediately the angel left him. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people with what they were expecting. And so here we see that the angel awakens Peter. Peter is chained between two guards. This is a common practice. We see later that Paul would also be chained to Roman soldiers. Soldiers, and so the angel comes the night that he's about to be uh, behe about to be probably beheaded at this time. And what is he doing? He's asleep, right? 
I mean, maybe he was at peace, maybe he was exhausted. I don't know. But the idea this man knew that he was going to be beheaded the next day and was sleeping, I mean, I mean, to me that says something about your faith in God and the faith that he had, even despite his precarious situation. And so he has a miraculous escape. The chains fall off, the doors open up, the iron gates open, and uh, he passes through at least four soldiers, probably even more. And so Peter thinks this, first he thinks it's kind of a vision. Peter's had many visions before. We've seen this even in Acts 10. But he finally realizes this is not a dream. Like this, this, is, this is the real deal. And so then he goes on. Let's read verses 12 through 19 of our text. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose name was Mark. And while they were gathered together, they were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the, of the, the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came and answered. And recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, You're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, It is, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But monitoring, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Tell these things to James and the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. Now when the day came, there was little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him, he did not find him. He examined the sentries in order that they should be put to death. And then he went down from Judea to, Caesar to Caesarea and spoke spent time there. And so, once again, the church was a symbol for prayer. There's something powerful in communal prayer that we take too often for granted. And then they go to the house of Mary. Now, this is one of six Marys mentioned in the New Testament. Now, this Mary was probably wealthy because she had a big enough courtyard to have a gate. She also had a big enough house to house the congregation that was there in that particular part of Jerusalem. And then she was also probably a widow because her husband is not mentioned, and she's the mother of John Mark. Now, if she's the mother of John Mark, what does that make her to Barnabas? Not a sister. That's exactly right. And so this is Barnabas' aunt. Now when Barnabas and Saul left Antioch and went to go stay in Jerusalem and had to stay somewhere, where do you think they stayed? Probably with family. Especially if your aunt just so happens to own the house church where Peter frequents. So Barnabas and Saul, and remember, this story is put right in the middle of the last verse of chapter 11, which says that Saul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem. And the very end of Acts chapter 12 is going to say, and then Paul and Barnabas took John Mark back with them to Antioch. And so it's very, I think it's highly likely that these individuals who are there praying, that Barnabas and Saul are there with them praying on behalf of Peter. And so Rhoda is, means Rose. She's a servant girl. She goes to the door. And how do we know that Peter probably came to this house often? Yeah. I mean, you don't recognize somebody's voice that you don't have spent some time around, right? And so, and which is it's funny, right? Because they're all praying for Peter. They're worried about Peter. Peter's at the gate. She hears his voice. And what does she do? She doesn't open the gate. She runs back to the people, right? It's like you could have opened the gate and Peter could have came with you to the people. But she runs back. She's like, Peter's at the gate. They're like, no, he's not. Yes, he is. And this is another thing. Oftentimes when we pray for things, right, and God delivers, what do we do a lot of times? We believe it, but we think, well, that was circumstance, right? You know, I prayed for it, and it came true, you know, and it just, that's just the way life, it's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Sometimes we don't give God credit for the blessings He gives us when we pray for things, right? And so we've got to be sure we realize we pray for something, be ready for it to come true. And so they, they, they argue for a little bit. She goes back, she opens the door, and Peter tells of his escape. Herod finds that the soldiers have allowed Peter to escape. And so in the ancient world, if you were guarding a soldier and that soldier disappeared, that punishment now went to you. And so if that soldier's punishment was a fine, the fine would be extracted from you. If, that's, if that prisoner's punishment was going to be a public, a public flogging or scourging, you would be publicly flogged or scourged. But in this case, what is Peter's uh, condemnation? What is his Death, right? You know, beheading. And so these 16 soldiers are executed uh, for letting Peter go. So Peter goes, he hides himself. And then we have verses 20 through 25 to finish out the chapter. 
Now Herod was angry when the people of Tyre and Sidon came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. And on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat on the throne, and he delivered an, or or an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give glory to God, he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. And so here we have... Um, the story of Herod. And so he was sitting there, and in the east, emperor worship was a thing. I mean, there are all kinds of temples that were dedicated to Augustus and Caesar and Claudius and Nero. And so it was common in the east for people to worship their rulers. People of Tyre and Sidon are not Jews, but they're Gentiles. They're in the east, and so they would probably been familiar with this worship of the guy in power. So they start to worship the voice of a God, not of a man. Herod doesn't do anything to quell this. And it's not just the Bible that says that he was struck down by God. Josephus, who is a first century Jewish historian, writing about this event, also says that God struck down Herod because the people were cheering him and praising him as a God and he did nothing to stop it. Now Herod gives us a few more details and says that he was struck down with intense pain in his stomach and that he died five days later at the age of 54. And so here we see that he dies, that God continues to multiply the word now that Herod is dead and maybe taking some pressure off the church there in Palestine. And then when the, the narrative goes back to Paul and, and Barnabas or Barnabas and Saul. Interestingly in Acts chapter 12 is the last time that you'll see Barnabas and Saul. It'll now become what? Saul. Not Saul and Barnabas. Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas. So before nine, before yeah, that's, that's what it changes. Right? So people are like, well, his name changed at his conversion. He's converted in what chapter? Nine. His name changes in what chapter? Thirteen, right? Before chapter thirteen, it's always Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul. Acts 13, Saul is Paul and Barnabas. Right? I did it too, Brother Ed, so don't worry about it. Um, and so they take John Mark back to Antioch. And also when Acts, a major shift takes place. No longer is the focus of Acts going to be in Palestine and Peter. Now it's going to be on Paul and the westward, westward expansion of the church. And so our takeaways, the importance of prayer. And so we've got to be sure that we realize the importance of prayer. And not just of prayer, but communal prayer. When the church gathers together, there's great power in prayer. Number two, that God is in control. James wasn't saved. Peter was. It wasn't the fact that Herod was more influential or powerful with James and less powerful with Peter. God is in control and things are going to happen according to His will. The third thing is the gospel spreads despite persecution. And so it's important for us to be able to be focused on spreading the gospel today, despite the situation we find ourselves to be in. Um, does anyone have any other questions or comments over Acts chapter 12? Over James, Peter, Herod? Have you studied the Herod being eaten by worms? Was that more like parasites? Yeah, that's what it seems like it is when it says with worms. And so Josephus doesn't give us any descriptions. Of course, Josephus is writing probably about 25 years after the case, but would have been uh, familiar with, with the Jewish tale of what happened. And so evidently there was intense pain in his, like you were saying, his gut, his stomach, which he succumbed to five days later. And the Bible says that it was worms. So it must have been some type of parasite. So good question. Yeah, uh, yeah, Herod got, uh, got it back, I guess you would say. Um, there's, an old, there's an old saying that goes back to like the 2nd century. And it, I think it was during the time of Nero, when Nero was persecuting Christians there in Rome. And it said, you know, what is your God doing now? You know, kind of like, you know, his people are being persecuted. He's doing nothing. Like, what is, what is he doing? And the Christian responded, he's making a coffin for your emperor. And, you know... You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, your emperor's going to die someday. You know, he'll have to face his judgment someday. Anyways, um, let's go ahead and let's close the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the example of James, for the ability that he had to preach your gospel and to be a witness to the resurrection of Christ so boldly, and that he faced death and went to his death, uh, never relenting or relinquishing his faith in you and your son. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the faith and the... Um, 
the boldness of Peter to be able to look death in the face, the face and to be able to sleep in peace and to be able to continue his work in spreading the gospel. And we're so thankful for the illustration of the power of prayer. And dear Heavenly Father, as we look through the book of Acts and we see the actions that are done by these men and these women, that we continue to live each and every day realizing that uh, the story of your church in this world is still continuing and that we are now the, the, the church and that we're the ones who are writing our stories and our faith to you. And dear Heavenly Father, please help us to have that type of faith and commitment to be able to spread your word to those who are lost, to be able to stand in front of those who would be violent against us because of our beliefs and stay strong because of our faith and trust in you and help us to continue the tradition of being faithful to death even if it means losing our own lives so that we can have a crown of life with you in heaven one day. Please watch over us and bless us. Your son, we pray. Amen.